Welcome to CU Learning Tracks, a new educational program designed to benefit everyone in the credit union movement. From those who serve members directly each and every day to those who support the colleagues who do. And CU Learning Tracks even has a dedicated curriculum for those who serve in credit union boardrooms. In CU Learning Tracks, experts will guide participant dialogue in thought-provoking sessions and credit union industry peers from across the nation will share their experiences. Today is the beginning of CU Learning Tracks, and we have an additional eight full days of content lined up for the remaining part of this year. We're glad you are here. Enjoy CU Learning Tracks. Good afternoon, I'm Will Hall, the Northwest Credit Union Director of Legal Advocacy. Welcome to Credit Union Learning Tracks. This session is called Preparing for Pandemics, Cyber Attacks, Black Swans, and Business Continuity Planning, Part One, Cybersecurity. Today, we'll hear and learn from two experts in the field of cybersecurity who will discuss not only the current potential threats, but also proven best practices for mitigating risk and protecting the credit union and its members. In just a moment, I'll introduce our first speaker, but first a few details about obtaining CPE credit for this session. To be, to be eligible for this credit, you must attend the entire session on the event day, not as an on-demand session, participate in a quiz, there's a button at the top, that will be made available to you at a random time during the session and complete the survey at the end that provides us with your email address for the certificate. Once the criteria are verified, a certificate will be sent within two weeks of the event date. So that's the CPE credit. Now I'll introduce our first speaker, Scott Aldridge. Scott is CEO of IP Services, which specializes in next generation managed IT services and managed cybersecurity services for critical systems and applications. He has over 30 years of experience in the information technology business arena, is a founding member and president of the IT Process Institute, and is a recognized expert in the field. In fact, last year, Aldridge testified before the U.S. Senate on how organizations can implement effective cyber defenses. Thank you for being here, Scott. Please take it away. Thank you, Will, for that introduction. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to share and hopefully uh, provide some good insights to preparing for the pandemic and what we've been in the middle of in the pandemic. Um, first, advance my slides here. And uh, just by way of going a little deeper in my background and experience, um, Will covered it and I appreciate the introduction. Um, IP Services was actually spun out of a Fortune 500 integrator uh, way back in the early 2000s and after su uh, supporting a variety of different enterprise networks. And it was shortly after that that uh, some of our team was asked to provide some ongoing services uh, to some of our clients in more of a managed services role and a security services role. Back in the early 2000s, you didn't see a lot of this. So we sometimes joked that we were doing managed services and cybersecurity services before it was cool. A lot of your larger enterprise organizations, you know, your AT&Ts and, and uh, your AGNS type groups and stuff did a lot of services, but there weren't a lot of niche industry specific providers that were like ourselves. And so it's been a great uh, opportunity to uh, work on best practices and learn what those are. And of course, in that sojourn, we partnered up with some companies that are the likes of HP and Tripwire Software. And we launched an organization called the IT Process Institute, which really exists to do research and then benchmark and then provide prescriptive guidance um, you know, how do you apply those best practices? And it's been a very interesting time of discovery uh, as we got into the middle to the end of the 2000 time period. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And so that's afforded us the opportunity to be involved in some various uh, thought leadership roles uh, in the, you know, IT and cybersecurity space, operations space. And we really founded a lot of the best practices that I'll speak really come back to the ITIL, the IT infrastructure library. And again, Back in the early 2000s, you could Google ITIL and you'd come up with very little after pages and pages. And today, most of us are familiar with what the IT infrastructure library is and the framework, and certainly it's easy to garner information on it as well. And so with that, we've been able to advise some of the, you know, the world's top service providers and uh, you know, various levels in IT and cybersecurity. And it's been a, a very, very fun time, but yet a very challenging time. And we're going to get right into that. So today we know that we have a variety of different attack surfaces out there as we refer to them. 
you can see on you know the slide there's just a variety of different things all the way from your network to databases to remote users and we'll focus a little bit on that one today in light of the pandemic and and the onset of the remote uh, workforce broadening so much but they're all targets and uh, each one of these it basically presents a potential threat a potential hacker bad actor to uh, exploit it and to get in. You can see that they're all challenging, right? There's lots of challenges in each of those particular tax services. Before we even really get to a lot of cybersecurity issues, there's just challenges in general. And so focusing just a little bit on, you know, the home, you know, uh, user, or I should say the remote workforce, you know, uh, member of your network, that presents so many things as well as the internet of things that they're accessing devices that also access the network. The average time to detect and want to change 190 days, which is an enormous amount of time. And a lot of times bad actors or various hackers will deposit some code or exploit and then really not act on that for sometimes months, weeks, you know, sometimes even years. So it's very interesting. So just kind of looking up at a high level, at the, the landscape of cybersecurity and threats and looking at things from more of a pre-COVID timeframe, we see that the CAGR, the compound and annual growth rate over eight years of spending was almost 8%, which is over 60% over that eight year period. That's a significant amount of spending in IT budgets. Yet we see that our security incidents and breaches uh, compound annual growth rate at 34%. So you multiply that by eight, you've got 240 percent increase of security incidents and breaches. So we're spending a lot more money, and yet we're not stopping this, the bad actors and the breaches and the hacks that are going on out there. So again, attack services, as I was sharing about those targets, you know, they were a bit more physical uh, in their location, so they were a little easier to identify. They weren't quite as broad. And obviously security best practices and methodologies were very important, and most organizations have spent a lot of energy, resources, money, on tightening up their cybersecurity posture. So we look at post-COVID, in essence, not a lot's changed when you get right down to it. However, we are gonna probably have some financial challenges in terms of our budgets. Decline in overall revenue profitability, we don't really know what that looks like yet, we're in the middle of it. And that could challenge some of our security spend, as well as um, indications of breaches and incidents are gonna continue to increase, particularly as I shared as the you know, home uh, users and the home uh, office employees are going to broaden the attack surfaces. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get deeper into the presentation. So obviously, I, you know, best practices and, and using fewer resources to accomplish more is going to be very critical as we move forward and as we are moving forward in the middle of the, the pandemic. I want to step back and talk about the ITPI a little bit. As I shared earlier, um, we really exist for three primary activities, and that's to do research, and then on the quantitative collection of data, apply good analytics to that data and benchmark uh, the data. And then of course, ultimately, kind of right what we call the golden, we call the golden thread. And the golden thread being that, you know, the actual prescription, a lot of the information as we look at some of the frameworks, as I know Tony shared earlier, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit daunting in the prescription of that, uh, I'm sorry, the descriptive of what those are, right? They talk about controls in a little bit of an abstract. And so we really work on practical, you know, bootstrap, you know, methods that you can use to actually employ and, and really use those controls as a, a guiding framework, but then actually have the tools to actually know how to apply it and to make it actionable and work for your organization and your credit union. So we were established way back in the mid 2000s uh, as we were starting to want to follow the best practices and finding out what truly are best practices because back in that time there wasn't a lot of things that were really specific to best. We had old control frameworks like COBIT and COSO, again good ones but not a lot out there that really spoke in IT language. So the ITIL really through the study of the ITPI gave us a common parlance into how we address IT and break things down. And so the, the IT Process Institute was really founded and developed to support IT audit, you know, security and IT operations. Speaking a little bit earlier as you did uh, uh, in this introduction, there, this particular presentation and some of the various specifics I'm sharing, uh, just to know the relevancy of them was even shared before Congress. Uh, the uh, CEO, John Gilligan of CIS, which you heard from Tony's organization earlier, um, they have actually cited uh, some of the study that the ITB, IT Process Institute has done 
uh, in regards to really stopping uh, cyber attacks and being able to auto detect those things. And I'm gonna share kind of some of the secret sauce here in a little bit as to what that looks like. So I just wanted to cover that in the relevance of the study. So in one of uh, the CCNR, which is the con uh, change, config, uh, and release management or processes that we studied in IT, which are all ITIL processes, we found that top performers came out with some really amazing results if they had good configuration management, good change management, and good release management practices. We see that downtimes of top performers were 30 minutes or less, so they had a high availability uh, rating. Their release impact of rate was 2.9 of, of that caused an incident. So in other words, 97% of their releases were, were positive releases and successful releases. And their incidents were fixed within their service level agreement times within 30, you know, 93% of the time. So that's a high performance to their users. So that really all, all of those things really make up what a best practice, but the big one and the one to emphasize that's really relevant for today in terms of how we're looking at addressing cybersecurity and increasing our cyber postures is that auto detection of incidents were 91% of breaches. So these organizations that understood their configurations, understood change, and understood release in their organization, they actually had a very, very high result in being able to defend themselves against the bad actors and the breaches. They would auto detect 91% of the time. So we used a lot of the study uh, that I shared in the method of the IT Process Institute, and of course, particularly the config change and release study, to write the visible ops series of books back in the, the mid 2000s. And to this day continues to be a good seller because it really looks at the ITIL and it says, if you focus on these three core closed loop processes, you actually kind of get the 80-20 benefit. And these processes really knock a home run out of your availability and the controls that have been shared that are critical controls that you should have that CIS calls out. It really does a great job at dealing with those. And so. We've sold over 400,000 copies of this book. It's been a while. It's been an Amazon IT bestseller for, for a long season of time back in the late 2000s. And I'm very excited. And we'll talk a little bit more about specifically what, what we get into. And as this particular slide really ties the, these key controls that we looked at that, can, that basically predicted the high performers, and I shared those results just there a couple of slides back, it really is that focus on config, change, and release management. And sometimes... I use um, an example, and for lack of a better example, what we're gonna, I'm gonna go back a slide, and you see the yellow handbook, and you'll see that you know it's we know that it's you know eight inches wide and nine in inches long, and so why it has so much exact characters of print, and the yellow color is exact, and the red handbook, and all the details of that as I describe that particular book, just as a an example, and not a great example, but go with me on this one. And so the ideas in our networks and in our, our various network devices, all the way from workstations out to servers, to firewalls, to, to all of those uh, nodes that we call in our network, we really need to know the exact configuration of what it's in. We know exactly how it's configured. We know exactly what state and that it's in a well-known, good, secure state. We lock that down. And doing that process is what we really call configuration management, knowing the specific configurations that a particular device uh, or network node has. And then we apply good change management. We electrify the fence, as we call it in the book. And the idea there is that no change is going to happen to that well-known good secure configuration without vetting it through proper change management practices. So we do things like we classify change. Is it an already pre-approved change or is it a significant change? And if it was significant, we would then call out a cab or a change advisory board and we get into how ITIL really calls out the way to, pro to manage the process of change using best practice. And so by following that, we learn, and some of that comes from some of the early studies in the 2000s, IDC, Gartner, Yankee, ITPI, that 80%, somewhere between 74 and 84% of all IT failure is correlated to some unapproved, untested change. And so if we manage change effectively using best practices, we know that we're gonna knock a home run out of availability because downtime is gonna be increased. Also, there's a lot of other benefits like rework and all of the other things that go uh, with you know, a failed change that cause time, energy, resources, and money. 
So that's the change. And then that's the, that lives on top of the configuration. We know the configuration of that. We know nobody's going to change that book now, that yellow book, or take a stripe off or change a text piece or whatever it might be without following good change management. And then we follow release management, which means as things are in development and they're being released or it's a patch, it's an upgrade of a version, that that's tested in a process, that we actually have rollback in place and all the good practices and best practices that follow release management. So those become a closed loop process. Releases are you know, tested and pre-approved. They're vetted through change, change updates the config, and then as the config is updated, we know it's in a next state of well-known secure config, working config, then we roll back into this loop, this kind of closed loop process that can repeat itself. So getting to the controls specifically around release change and configuration management, you'll see that the um, top six controls uh, of the top security controls that CIS uh, really identifies that each organization and your credit union really should be following or have a goal to follow as a framework to really provide holistic security uh, in your organization around your IT assets. You'll see that we, we knock home run a lot of the various things in our study and by following this implementation of a visible ops methodology, knocks out inventory and control assets of hardware uh, and software assets. In the change management and the configuration and management practices, one of the key factors is called a CMDB, which is a configuration management database, another ITIL term. But that database holds all the CIs. Those are the configuration items. And that's really what this is addressing in one and two. Do you know all of the pieces and parts that make up the topology of your network that make it really looking at it as a system all the way from your software operating systems and the applications all the way down to how many desktops and what the desktop assets look like. So that really hits one and two. And then number three is that we're able to contain vulnerability management because we know what our configuration is. And so we know it's in a good secure state. There's not going to be new vulnerabilities created unless a change has happened. We kind of quip sometimes that no security breach ever happened without a change or a need for a change. So again, that gets, speaks to number three, four, and five when you get right down to it in these controls because if somebody would have to change something to allow other administrative privileges to be uh, you know, opened up on a particular device or network or server. And then, of course, secure configurations, getting to that configuration, and particularly down to the you know, home office user and the remote workforce that we're dealing with today really having some way to monitor those devices. And I'll speak to that just a little bit later, later with some specificity on kind of the best practices right now around how you do that effectively. Um, and then of course, maintenance and monitoring of audit logs. This gets a little bit into SIM. And of course, this also gets back to your configuration and change management. If we know what's in our particular configurations and we've managed all of the change and we're following good release practices, we're not gonna have any surprises. So really ties in well, and we really believe in the CIS control as really a standard and a framework to follow. And it really fits right into our I visible ops methodology and the ITIL parlance for how we address and manage IT. I'm gonna kind of shift gears just a little, not a lot, but talk a little bit very, you know, specifically to kind of the cyber hygiene practices that really each of your credit unions should be following particularly as we're looking at a broader, bigger remote workforce and in this time. But these are also best practices anyway and really having good, solid uh, cybersecurity hygiene. So I'm gonna cover those. And then the last four, six, seven, eight, nine are gonna be more specific to the remote workforce. But you'll see that uh, you know, the online trust alliance stat, 93%, uh, it's a 17 stat. I've actually seen it referred to in an article by another one, but Gardner did. But all breaches could be avoided if we just followed some good, basic, cyber hygiene practices. Um, matter of fact, a big one of those, 70 to 80%, is just simply patching. And I'll talk about that, making sure you have the latest patches on your operating systems and your software systems. So number one uh, through nine, I'll let you read those on the screen. I'm not gonna know because we're gonna go into each one and break it down individually. So first, let's talk about security awareness training. This is a very common thing over the last four or five years. Most organizations have been hearing that this is a real critical thing to keep your employees from clicking on that email or malware. Ransomware is very tied to this one. We all know it. And what we've seen in the marketplace over the last two or three years, particularly, and even amongst credit unions, is it's kind of a one and done kind of thing. So they'll go roll out training um, for their employees of, of the credit union. 
and really uh, work on that in a one-time thing. And then as they hire new people, they'll train them in that practice of really being aware of what to click on, not to be fished and fies, understand those things, your social media, how you engage and use your, they'll do a lot of training. And then they tend to just be done and figure that they've covered it because everybody comes in should know what to do. However, you, uh, another study, and I don't have the slide, recently showed that m most of the ransomware breaches come from people that have had some form of awareness training at some point. So what we're learning is that it's a continual process. You, matter of fact, one of the tools that we use in our organization with our clients is a tool that actually goes out and you create campaigns to try to fish your own, uh, in your own organization, your own people, your own users. And of course, if they click on something, it'll actually block their PC from operation, redirect them to training for 15 to 20 minutes, and then they can be released to go back to work so that they learn that if you're clicking on something, and so it's better to you know catch it in a, in a practice situation than obviously to have something bad happen in your organization. The biggest one, obviously, that we all know about is the clicking on emails or links that we are not um, you know, validated or have not validated if they're secure or good attachments or they're good links, etc. So that's a really important one. Ongoing security awareness programs is the key, not one time. Really important, and it's something we can't let up let up on. We need to keep that continual awareness and training going on in our organizations, however that is. Matter of fact, some of uh, our clients actually, you know, do lunch and learns, and they've for all their organization just to talk specifically about the broad users and to attract them to come and learn more about security awareness and be more aware and, and talk about the latest tricks out there that are fooling people into clicking or allowing somebody to hack something on their workstation that's within their control. Secondly, we have patch management. I referred to this a little earlier. This is back to that stat, some say you know, 70, 80%. The one that was, I think, from a Verizon survey, 57%, you know, come from patches that could have been avoided. Just like our iPhones, we see that red notice on there that we have an update and we don't really want to take the time, but it's really critical in not only for the performance of the phone and the software, which is a benefit just for efficiency, but also oftentimes those patches are fixing any security holes or uh, many security vulnerabilities that may have uh, been exploited by the bad actors. Very important. We all know like Microsoft patching for the Microsoft operating systems and Linux for the Linux systems and of course our firewalls for Cisco systems and FortiGate systems. So again, 80% of companies that have either had a breach could have prevented it with the right patch. Pretty, pretty incredible. 99% of vulnerabilities will continue to be known as security uh, for at least a year. So the other thing is people often will, and I spoke to this earlier, they'll find a hole in a network, uh, particularly, uh, and deposit a piece of software uh, that may be some kind of a, a little applet that will siphon off critical secure information, even credit cards in some cases, this has happened, but they let it sit there for months before they actually invoke the software to make it start happening. So they wait until it's least expected, or maybe it's a high seasonality business and they'll want to siphon off as more credit cards as they can before they're shut down or they're found out. So that's a real typical thing. And then of course, an effective patch management also needs to include zero day vulnerabilities, meaning that if there's a big security hole that's been announced, and Microsoft or a particular software application uh, says that you need to apply this as soon as possible because it's a huge hole in your network from a security perspective. You need to have a program that has the ability to schedule immediate patch windows, uh, maintenance windows, and apply those patches. So there needs to, the company needs to be continually looking out for those particular notices and paying attention to those notices. Um, a lot of organizations will do patching, but they don't really look on a daily basis. And anymore, somebody needs to be checking daily to make sure there's not some security emergency release of a patch. Easy to say, all the things I'm sharing with, not so easy to do and follow the rigor of continually applying those things. So external remediation uh, vulnerability scanning, there needs to be internal and external scanning that applies. Uh, as well as penetration testing. Two different things. Penetration is looking at things from the outside. Maybe they'll scan your network and you, they'll even do physical checks, whereas vulnerability is looking for those holes that are in your network uh, from the inside, and it uses various tooling, and it's a service that often is provided, service that we provide to make sure that things are continually done. It used to be once a quarter, once every year, or twice a year. Now it's a monthly practice, best practice to vulnerability scan. 
don't really need to talk about these processes about things, but I do want to talk about SIM. This one, the FFIEC is requiring that you use SIM and that's SIMB, and that's, secu that's security information event management. And basically it means you need to be collecting all of the logs in your network and in your systems. And those particular logs need to be actionable. So you can't just collect them, but you need to be looking for any of those holes that may be in there. And that's something that the, and then correlating those to any particular you know, bad behavior that may be happening. If somebody's logging in from a branch that shouldn't be logging into some core system, you wanna know that and a log will show it and you can react and respond to it. The FFIEC tells us that we need to be doing uh, management of our SIM and looking at those things actively. It's a requirement. It's not just an option. And so you know, security perimeter effective change management processes, I spoke about this a little bit. Knowing that you have a change management practice that you're following is really important. And uh, a lot of the studies show us that change can, you know, is basically the the cause for downtime um, on many, many networks and systems and a very high percentage. And if you do change effectively on your perimeter and you know what, how your configurations are, you're gonna knock a home run out of your security and your availability. These next four, real quick, I'm gonna rip through in about three minutes, but basically these ones are about multi-factor authentication. They're about your kind of home office users and the attack surfaces being broadened. These are things that you should be employing to make sure that you're keeping good cybersecurity hygiene as you've deployed a remote workforce. We most of us know about multi-factor authentication, you know, getting a text or an, SM, you know, an SMS text or a phone call or an email to verify we are who we say we are. A lot of us will use cloud tools that we have to have that feature on. The other one is VPN. Just because we say the words VPN doesn't mean that it's secure and that it's gonna be a great network. We need to know that the VPN configuration and your IT should know this groups in your credit unions, that they're able to be patched, that they're continually, if there's a new VPN client, it needs to be put out there. Nailed VPNs between two sites is best because it's hardware that can be patched, but the software VPNs need to be patched as well. Number eight, strong passwords and phrases. Kind of a new method here on password phrasing that I got taken to school on recently is that phraseology is better. Using a phrase, I like to walk my dog in the park on sunny days, is a much better password method than to use a strong password with characters and numbers. The bad actors have learned how to hack those and use algorithms to hack them much quicker. So longer the string, the character string, the better and harder it is for those actors to hack that security. So that's a really important one that your users are using phraseology and strong passwords. And then the last one is number nine, deep state network flow monitoring. This one's a little bit technical, but it's similar to SIM in the sense that we're looking at logs, but we're actually looking at the network on those home host systems. You don't know if somebody has a session and if it doesn't expire and it's open and they leave the home and you know, Johnny or Sally, the you know, middle schooler comes in that loves to hack, they could be on your credit unions network. We open up a huge attack service in the home. So if we're looking at the network traffic and the flow of traffic on those hosts with your remote users, you're gonna see behavior, you can set thresholds and monitor and kick alerts to see behavior that's out of the norm. And so that can be investigated and be very proactive in shutting down potential cybersecurity threats. We at IP services, we, a lot of the things we share, uh, that I've shared in this presentation is really we eat our own dog food as we joke. We really are familiar with regulated environments, work a lot with credit unions. We really look at clients in a strategic relationship and we really try to align your IT requirements with really what you're invest, that you're investing in the right controls to meet the business requirements and really the vision and the mission of your credit union. So thank you for the opportunity to present today and uh, had to rush a little bit there at the end, but uh, hopefully you got some good value out of today. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Really appreciate it. Uh, it was great information. I think credit unions will have some good takeaways from it as well. Now I'd like to introduce Tony Sager. Tony is Senior Vice President and Chief Evangelist for the Center for Internet Security. At the center, he leads development of CIS Controls, a worldwide consensus project to find and support technical best practices in cybersecurity. Tony's work at CIS is his second career. His first was at the National Security Agency, where he worked for 34 years as an information assurance professional. While at the NSA, Sager led the release of the agency's security guidance to the public and expanded the NSA's role in the development of open standards for security. His work and that of his teams at the NSA were widely recognized for technical admission excellence with awards from industry groups such as SANS Institute, SC Magazine, and Government Executive Magazine. Thank you for being with us, Tony. Take it away. Hi, this is Tony Sager with the Center for Internet Security. So it's a pleasure to join you today. Uh, first, a word about CIS. 
We are a small but mighty nonprofit, and we have two major mission areas. One is in operational support, primarily for state, local, tribal, territorial governments across the U.S., and that work is sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security. So we are the multi-state ISAC. We also do the same for the election infrastructure ISAC, and that uh, deals primarily with elections officials across the country and their uh, support infrastructure. So we provide a full range of operational support, including um, bulletins, advisories, we're watching bad things that happen, uh, warning people about them, helping them recover from cyber incidents, that sort of thing. Uh, the prim uh, primary mission of uh, CIS is around best practices. So we are the world's largest producer of uh, security configuration guidance. So if you want to know the best way uh, to configure a Windows desktop or a web server or a mail server for security effect, uh, come see us. We have all that information. It's created by a volunteer army. Our company organizes, supports the products, kind of brings professionalism to uh, this crowdsourcing of security opinions. Uh, we do that for benchmarks, and then at a higher level of abstraction, we have something called the CIS critical security controls, and those are more uh, at the level of operational practices. So how do I operate my IT for best security? How do I organize it, compose it, put things together, and so forth? And so that'll be the topic today, and we'll talk uh, about security frameworks in general and kind of how, how all that fits together. So it's a complicated world of security. Uh, bear with me. But you know, we, are do, we do our best at CIS to try to simplify the problem, get down to the essential elements, recognizing that this is sort of uh, not the kind of thing where you could ask everybody in the country to solve this problem on their own. That would be absolute insanity. So a few thoughts about what we're doing at CIS um, and a few thoughts about frameworks in particular. And I've, I'm um, just for background, I've been in this business for 43 years now and counting, and you probably don't even realize it's been around for 43 years, but sure enough, I started at the National Security Agency in 1977 in uh, mathematics and in computer science. And uh, at that time, this idea of cybersecurity, we really called up by other names, communication security, information security, and things like that. But we were very focused on government systems and on the protection of uh, the information technology and the information that was being processed upon it. So uh, lucky me, I got to ride the wave that we call cybersecurity now. And so I've had a chance to um, both learn from mistakes and make a lot of mistakes during my time. So I I'll hope I can share a little bit with you to help you avoid some of those mistakes. But anytime you talk about frameworks or standards or anything like that, you have to consider uh, this is a very complicated world and you have lots of different things you have to think about. So these are, these are some examples. Uh, whenever you talk about security framework, you have to look at what is the level of abstraction, right? What level is the language? Are they talking about sort of discrete things or sort of abstract things? Are the things that they're asking you to do in this framework, are they prescriptive? You know, that is, they tell you what to do, you have an idea what needs to get done and you sort of, you can work through that. Or are they descriptive? That is, they sort of describe to you or they ask you to talk about how to think about the problem as opposed to how to solve a problem. And so those are really different beasts and you'll see uh, all kinds of uh, variants of that in this business. Uh, are the actions that are in this framework, are they prioritized? Are they kind of left up to the reader? And you'll find a lot of them really do leave things up to the reader. And there's sort of a school of thought I call the uh, special snowflake school of security, right? We're all so special and unique that, uh, you know, no one size could possibly fit all and yada, yada. <clears throat> I get that, we all learned that in grade school, but uh, it's actually not true in cybersecurity. In this space, we actually have more in common than we do that's different. That is, we're all on the same internet, using the same technology, dealing with this soup of bad stuff that's happening all the time in security. And so there's a lot of uh, bad news there because there's so much to worry about. But the good news is there's lots of room for shared knowledge, common action, common solutions. Uh, frameworks also deal with a wide, wide range of th things. Are they dealing with kind of describing the process or the outcome or some variation thereof? So lots of uh, frameworks talk about you have to go through all these steps and they're a little vague on that outcome business. You know, the assumption is if you follow the process, the outcome will be good. But hey, there's lots of counterexamples to that. So look carefully when you when you think about this aspect of it. Is the framework trying to help you sort of get to some baseline or is it trying to solve the entire problem? And, and that's important to understand because the comprehensive ones can be just literally overwhelming thousands of pages, lots of complex language. And so you spend a lot of time just figuring out what you need to do. And these other things on here are all important. You know, what, what level of uh, neutrality are they relative to technology? Are they sort of forcing you to solve problems a certain way? Or are they sort of leaving that for you to figure out? Are they required? Are they volunteer? You can see every manner of that. And the last one is kind of a big one. You know, are they a pass-fail list? 
Are they tied or are they tied into an improvement program? For example, uh, you know, large enterprises sometimes think of, okay, if you're going to be in my supply chain, here's a list of requirements you uh, you have to meet, and good luck with that. And if you don't meet it, too bad for you. I'll find somebody else. Or is the framework really tied with some broader improvement program? That is, the goal is to help everyone get better, which is uh, good news for the supply chain, the, the 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 top of the supply chain there, because they would like to have an assortment of suppliers, right? All of whom meet uh, good security properties. But no matter, you know, these are all the ranges of things that you need to think about. But don't don't get overwhelmed because at the end of the day, frameworks are really about. How do I organize information? How do I bring it in? And how do I make decisions and then take action upon it, right? And I, I uh, did a survey once with a, uh, um, a company that's close to us. And uh, one of the uh, questions asked, uh, you know, do you use a sec uh, security framework? And if so, which one? And uh, to my surprise, there were, I think, 20 or 25% said they don't use any security framework. Well, okay, I got it. Uh, maybe that stuff you know doesn't apply in your particular sector. But you know, what, whether you choose to or not, you have a framework, right? You, you take an information, you make a decision, you take action upon it. Now, you may not like your you know, your framework, right? It may be very ad hoc, not repeatable, et cetera, not explainable to somebody else. But at the end of the day, we all have some need to worry about this kind of information and figure out how are we going to do something about it. So a couple of the thoughts about frameworks. Uh, we've entered what I call the multi-framework era. That is, uh, in surveys that I've done, and you know, we know this is true for state and locals, but with uh, surveys I've done with company friends, uh, companies are telling us that they're not dealing with one framework or sort of one party looking over their shoulder. They're dealing with two, three, four, five, six or more, uh, you know, different regulatory frameworks, legal, uh, depending on, depending on uh, what part of the world you work in, what business line you're in. Everyone's looking over your shoulder. Supply chain is driving a lot of this. And so, you know, folks are very concerned now, a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff in the news about supply chains. So especially small companies are getting flooded with this sort of notion of um, questionnaires, uh, what they call instruments or uh, reports that you need to generate to prove that you're a responsible supply chain partner. Now, in the best case, if we actually could stand back and design all this, right, we would figure out, well, you know, what you want to do is get people to improve their security once and then have many ways to report it to all these different parties. But of course, life doesn't work that way, right? Everyone asks for their information in different words, using different language, different level of abstraction, all those factors that I talked about. So it's, it's been kind of chaotic. And so, you know, we're a small company also, right? And we are getting flooded with these questionnaires and supply chain instruments and all this kind of stuff. And we have professional people that live and breathe this stuff. And it's a challenging for us to keep up. So it's unimaginable that the rest of the economy can figure this out. And so in this world, cross mapping between uh, different frameworks becomes a necessity and an unfortunate necessity. And it's very complicated. Uh, vendors will do it. Uh, consultants will do it for you. Integrators will do it for you. You might have to do it yourself. It's not a very satisfying answer, but I think the real issue, and we are committed to this at CIS, is people like us that create these sort of uh, recommendations, best practices, frameworks, and so, so forth. We really need to find a way to simplify this problem. That is to create cross-mapping sort of inherently. That is, try to use the same language, try to talk about things at an appropriate level of abstraction and sort of naturally uh, cross-map across them. So I'll tell you a little bit about that in a bit, but uh, a couple other things. So uh, about the CIS controls, just for background, I mentioned uh, spending 35 years at the National Security Agency. My entire career has been security testing for defense. So th terms like uh, zero days, red teams, penetration testing, blue teams, you know, all that kind of stuff is, is my life. And so such as it is, and it has been amazing. And if I've had one kind of unique aspect to my career over this time, it's not that I'm any smarter than anybody else. It's that I've gotten to see failure at very large scale. So the red teams and blue teams that worked for me I, it, at uh, sort of my capstone job, I ran all the security testing uh, at NSA that went across the Defense Department, intelligence community, rest of government, et cetera. So I got to see things fail at really large scale. And, um, you know, see the, the technical skill it takes to find these problems, but also look at the problems that enterprises are struggling with. And about halfway through this career, it struck me, hey, all we're seeing is the same problems over and over again. You know, these really sort of basic fundamental problems, all these challenging things that you have to deal with every day. You know, it's not like uh, rocket science. It's like operational strain, right? All these complicated, messy things that when, when you uh, have to deal with a, a significantly scaled um, uh, IT environment, they're just 
challenging. And the technology is fragile. Uh, it's complicated. It wasn't designed for many of the things that we uh, try to do. And, you know, I looked at this problem of sort of the basics aren't getting done. And uh, it wasn't because the, the operators or the IT people that I met were lazy or they didn't care. It's just they're just overwhelmed by the problem. So in 2008 or so, I grabbed five friends and one of my friends are extraordinary people, uh, you know, people that were uh, professional attackers for the U.S. government, professional defenders, testers, technologists. I gathered five friends around the room and said, nobody leaves this room until we all agree on a small number of things that all of our friends should do. And please do not try to solve world hunger or peace in our time at this meeting, because that's what security people do. No matter, you, know, you get five of them in the room, they have to come up with lists of 500 things, right? Because they're all trying to one-up each other. Hey, there's a tremendous amount of skill, lots of knowledge, and they can quickly overwhelm you with all these different bad things that could happen and things you ought to do about it. Hey, I'm one of those people. I spent a lifetime doing that. But it's not helpful, right? It's complete. It's interesting. It's fun but it doesn't help people. We really need to help people get started. So that was the challenge I gave that group. Uh, it turned out to be a simple list of 10 things. If you don't know where to begin, start here. That's based on our experience. Uh, that letter went to the Pentagon, to the Air Force, to some friends of mine, got picked up by, um, I think, Tank in DC called the, the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the SANS Institute. And they created something that was formerly known as the Consensus Audit Guidelines, more properly known as the SANS Top 20. And think of it as a relatively small, not small, but relatively small list of the most important fundamental things that a large group of experienced people said, you really need to do this stuff. It's foundational and basic. It deals with most of the attacks that you will see, et cetera. So this notion of the SANS Top 20 and the SANS Institute, which is the largest teacher of cybersecurity in the world, took the idea and, and uh, maintained it. That it built a community around it, had events and posters and classes and that sort of stuff. Fast forward a few years, I retired in 2012 um, and went to work for the SANS Institute to uh, take on some special projects, wound up taking this project back over, and with their support and permission, spun it out into a nonprofit, and that's where we are now, at the Center for Internet Security, and you know, we formalized the naming, the CIS controls is the actual specific naming that we use. But the idea is still the same. It's the idea we started with all those years ago. What are the foundational things that you really need to do? And this is not speculation. This is based upon specific knowledge of attacks. What are the bad guys doing today? Not what's the not the universe of things they could do or that we can daydream about or that might happen, but what is really happening and how do I translate those things into action? That was the, the uh, really the challenge I put in front of that group originally, that group of five friends, and that we continue to this day. So the, this idea, uh, this is a, a graphic of the, the actual 20 items here. There's a, you know, a, a, multi-page document that goes with this that explains these. Uh, if you're in the IT and security business, nothing on here will be a surprise to you. This is not about magic or artwork or anything like that. It is really about discipline and good management, but organized in a way that we think is accessible to, to people. So uh, we have them grouped here, and, and we've had uh, several generations of this. this. This is a graphic for version 7. We've already started working on version 8, and a typical uh, a version will go for a couple of years. But these, um, we have them sort of grouped this way, basic, foundational, and organizational. I'll show you a little different grouping that we've moved to later. But the idea here is these are a prescriptive list of things that we have put together that we maintain, you know, and we do the kind of things that every enterprise, enterprise wishes they could do. That is, through crowdsourcing, I've got a large group of volunteers who are working closely with folks like the Verizon Data Breach folks, the, their equivalents at Palo Alto and Symantec and McAfee and IBM and companies like that, right? People who have lots of information about what attacks are really happening. We work together to try and translate that into action. So every enterprise on earth wishes they had a team of people like that. So the kind of volunteers we have are people you wish you could hire, but you probably can't even find them, right? They're scattered from around the world. They, they cut across the public and private sectors. And so it's an extraordinary group of people and their goal is to create information that allows you to not have to do all that work, right? Remember the good news or the bad news about this cybersecurity business is we all have to worry about it. The good news is there's no reason that we can't share our ideas, share our labor, because this problem affects all of us, whether we realize it or not. So uh, the, the other thing to remember about the critical controls is there's not one document 
it's really a whole ecosystem that's built up around it. And this is one of the things I uh, suggested you look at when you look at frameworks, right? It's great to have a, a nice piece of paper, uh, you know, a lovely document, a piece of shelfware, as we often call it. But if it doesn't build a community around it, right, people who help you and vendors who provide you with tools and people who give you training and sort of this sort of a, a self-help community that builds around it, then you're really not getting the full value of it. So I often say it's not about the list of things. It's about all the things that build up around it. And we've got lots of examples of this kind of stuff. If you uh, come meet us at cisecurity.org, you can get examples of all this sort of thing. But it's all in that same spirit of trying to help people with the most important things to do. Uh, be prescriptive, right? Don't uh, talk about the problem, but let's talk about how to solve the problem. Uh, we, we've admired this thing long enough. Uh, this thing has taken off over the last several years. It's really become institutionalized. Uh, this is a, just an example. There's both Euro lots of European adoption. There's lots of there's multiple states now that are building it into some sort of typically uh, incentivized adoption, either either for state agencies and or for companies doing business in that state. Uh, we're doing a seminar with Nevada on exactly that topic. I think in the next couple of weeks. I mentioned talking to the Verizon Data Breach Report. If you look at if you read one threat report every year, that's the one you should read. And you'll see how closely allied we are with the Verizon Data Breach Report. That is, this is the sort of granddaddy of all these annual reports based upon analyzing incidents. And we work closely with that team to figure out what do, what do people need to do about this? Uh, we're, you know, we've got lots of folks in the financial sector who've uh, adopted us at some level, like the Federal Reserve internal uh, audit process, and lots of stuff happening at then supply chains around this. So, you know, the, the idea is, again, it's not a list, it's really been institutionalized by a lot of different folks. Uh, I mentioned a, a different grouping here. We're very conscious of, you know, even the, uh, if you look at sort of traditional security frameworks, you, you might see, you know, hundreds, thousands of things to do, we, we sort of boil it down to a much tighter group, right? Not all the things you could do, but the things you really need to do. But even that can be overwhelming for folks. And so we've uh, come up with what we call implementation groups, which are, think of it as for that list of 20 things, sort of a cross-cutting horizontal look to say, you know, what, what are the basics that every organization should do, even if they really have no resources? Right. What are the absolute bedrock must do? They, they don't they don't have the money and time to bring in a consultant to do a, a, a risk analysis or anything like that. What should they just get to work on? That's implementation group one. And it's it's uh, uh, energy well spent because it's a subset of the two and the three. Right. You build upon this. But it really is our attempt to make this as simple as possible. It turned out this idea has really caught on. We've got lots of adopters uh, of it. A lot of uh, companies are using it as kind of the, the starting point for their company and also the starting point for their supply chain. We've also released and given away for free at no charge tools that are given out to the community for folks to help them manage this kind of implementation. That is, how will they actually do these things? How will they track how they're doing and that sort of thing? So you're starting to see really a, a, a whole system build up around this idea of implementation groups. Uh, if you looked at that list of 20 that I gave you, there's actually 171 uh, sort of sub items in there implementation group uh, one is about a quarter of those, right? It's a bit of procedural stuff and technical stuff. And, you know, it's it, the, the, the goal, we, we chose that set, right? These are not exotic, expensive technologies that take a lot of complicated implementation. A lot of these are procedural steps that you can just do with and take advantage of the technology that you already own. So these are really about a core essential set of things. We have given that a new term now, this implementation group one, basic cyber hygiene. So I've been around this business a long time. A lot of people say cyber hygiene, but very few actually define it. We have a definition because our feeling is if you don't have a definition, then you can't ask people to do things. You can't set it as a kind of a social expectation, right? You need some specific thing. Otherwise, you're just cheerleading for goodness and greatness, but that doesn't seem to be moving the needle very far. So it's really important to define uh, what we are talking about here. Uh, these are some of the ways that people use the controls, you know, and I won't go through them, but, you know, they, they are... Uh, sort of accessible enough, right? Readable as plain English as we know how to make them and really represent this, this notion of a translation from attacks to action. That's at the end of the day, you know, uh, the industry will tell you, you need to know more about threats and more about threats. And yeah, that's kind of true, but you know, most of us can't read that stuff. It's too voluminous. It's complicated. The language is specialized. At the end of the day, the reason you would read something like the Verizon report is not for entertainment. It's so you could translate it into action. And so the, the goal is to do that together, 
right? And if you want to be part of that, welcome to the team, right? We have a, uh, we run a uh, closed social media platform that you can be a member of if you would like to sort of see the sausage get made, be part of that discussion. As I mentioned, we're already working on version eight, which will be really re released sometime in 2021. And so if um, we have a small core group of people that does sort of the grunt level work to put together the draft, as it goes out, it'll go out to different companies and friends. And if you want to be in that uh, group, let me know because we'll have we'll cheerfully take your feedback. So all these different um, activities up here are different ways that people can use the controls and any other framework, right? There's, there's no rocket science here. This is about discipline, about planning, and about execution. And so uh, many folks use us at the, to that last bullet. Again, we are not, you know, we're not the U.S. government, right? We're not a regulatory agency. We, we're not PCI. No one has to do what we say. So we are a grassroots group of, uh, we're a nonprofit organizing volunteers that people have given us, right, taken our work and uh, put their authority behind it. And people often use us as either a starting point or as an alternative or as an on-ramp to other frameworks. And that's why this, this idea of mapping becomes really important. So, you know, and we're really committed to this. We wanna make this easier for you. We, we recognize there are lots of these things out there and it's a waste of energy for everyone to figure this out on their own. So we make uh, all of our stuff in the, uh, currently and in the future will be a cross map to anything NIST does that we can find and vice versa. They're working closely with us on this. We're, we're mapping our work to about every framework that you can see out there. Some of this comes to us from volunteers and then we put it out for comment and it becomes a product from us. Some of it we're, we're generating with our own folks, but we are absolutely committed to uh, simplifying that problem of having to deal with multiple frameworks. Because if we don't, there's going to be just so much tremendous wasted energy and that other, and every time you do it, if you have to do it on your own, the first auditor that walks in the door will tell you, you didn't do it right. And so that's just nonsense. So it's up to us, us to provide the sort of authoritative starting point to simplify this problem for you. So a couple other things uh, I'll mention here, as, as I said earlier, uh, the um, frameworks are just a way to to deal with this cybersecurity problem, right? To bring information in, to um, sort of make sense of it, translate it, take action upon it, execute a program of security improvements. And so there's a range of these things. You know, maybe you have to deal with certain ones, maybe you don't, maybe you choose to, or maybe you don't. But you know, part of part of the the, the challenge we have in here in our world is navigating all this stuff. And from CIS, we you know we're completely transparent about how we do things, how we choose things, uh, because you know if we don't do that then you don't get the full value of what we're creating. And you're, then you have to explain it to somebody else. So that's our goal here. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't explain the graphics here. There's a, uh, in the upper left is Will Smith from Independence Day. On the bottom right is uh, Bill Murray from Groundhog Day. I, I, I often say, we wish cybersecurity was like the movie Independence Day. You remember that one, right? The aliens are coming, the heroes, we take the alien uh, <clears throat> scout craft, we, you know, brilliant minds reverse engineer it, create the virus, the heroes fly up there deliver the virus, they escape just in time, boom goes the alien mothership, hooray for the good guys, parade, you know, hurrah, celebratory cigar. I've been working in cybersecurity for 40 plus years. No parade for the defender, right? There's no event. There's no one adversary we can go attack. There's no one invention that we can deal with that will solve this problem. Cybersecurity is much more like, yeah, the other movie Groundhog Day, right? The same day, the same thing happens over again. And, uh, you know, eventually Bill gets a little smarter. He starts experimenting in his world. Sometimes the result is positive, sometimes negative. But what you're really doing in cybersecurity is you're building a machine, right? An information processing machine. That is, how do I understand what's going on? How do I look at the business use of technology? How do I look at my options for defense as they come into the marketplace? How do I pull all that together, make sense of it, translate it into action? And so that's what you have to think about. And so that's what a framework allows you to do. It sort of pulls all that together to build this machine. And when you're building a machine, you want efficiency, right? You want low cost, you want repeatability, and all these nice attributes that go with, you know, with having a really well-designed machine. So with that, uh, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, the time has been short. I know I, I covered a lot of ground here. Happy to uh, continue the conversation with anyone in this group. Uh, this is what I'm doing in my second act of my career in cybersecurity, and it's really a pleasure to try and help people make sense of this business. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Scott and Tony, for the great information and takeaways. Now we have about five minutes or so for some Q&As. And to help with those, we have on hand Mark Allers, one of the cybersecurity experts at IP Services. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the chat, and we'll get to as many questions as we have time for. Mark, thank you for being with us. 
Thank so, you. So the first question is, Scott, Scott and Tony talked about best practices and frameworks as means to prevent and prepare for cyber attacks. What kinds of cyber attacks might credit unions anticipate given what you and your colleagues are seeing now? So that's really a two part question. The first is uh, the adoption of best practices in a, in a framework where it's predictable in its nature of, of understanding cybersecurity threats. So that would, um, you heard from Tony and Scott uh, recently here about the CIS um, controls and how they're broken out into 20 of them and they're prescriptive in nature as opposed to descriptive where it's you know, essentially just a list of everything you gotta go do. So we, we all know CI controls uh, very heavily. Uh, second part to that question is in recent times here with uh, everything that we've seen with COVID, the, uh, the, the risk associated to security has really gone from being vertical to horizontal. What I mean by that is um, with everyone working remotely, the attack surface has essentially gone horizontal. It's, it's literally gone exponential as opposed to a very siloed approach where all the uh, workforce would be in space. So that um, part of that question is what, what technologies or what things should be um, better understood? First and foremost, VPNs. All VPNs are not created equal. Um, and there's feature functionalities that will prohibit VPN connections in the event of certain uh, criteria not met from a security perspective. Hopefully that answers the question. Great, thanks. And then the uh, next question, of course, if you, if you have questions that uh, please put them into the chat and we'll get to those as well. I forgot to mention that um, again. And the second question I have, where are credit unions and other financial institutions most vulnerable to attacks right now? Well, th this really goes on to the, the tail end of the last question. Um, it is absolutely imperative for um, the security departments to look at trying to fit into these best practices methodologies specifically from a VPN perspective. Um, there, are, there are underlying uh, controls that uh, shore up, not only the VPN connections and that feature functionality, but in the event that things happen and there is a connection and bad things transpire from that connection, uh, you gotta be able to identify what, the, what those uh, uh, kind of what impact did they do? Did they add, modify, or delete anything? And be able to take corrective action in a matter of, of, of seconds and minutes. And in the industry today, when we talk about you know, mean time to identify, mean time to contain, uh, those statistics are up in the weeks. Um, the first is about 206 days to identify a breach. The second uh, to contain it is roughly 63 days. So uh, being able to adopt best practices in the context of, of the, kind of the, the horizontal nature of the attack surface is absolutely imperative. Uh, the next question is the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act requires the CFPB to issue rules to establish a standard for the sharing of consumer data by financial institution, institutions with the consumers themselves and with third parties, which some call open banking. Do you think we are ready for this from a cybersecurity perspective? The answer is yes and no. So the... the, the the yes answer to that is we're seeing plenty of, of things in the, U, uh, the UK and European um, uh, countries around GDPR. So we're, we're finding that kind of following suit relative to some of the compliance efforts and mandates around uh, consumer data and information. Um, but we have to look at history and, and history repeats itself. There was an effort uh, uh, that was uh, done through the Department of Defense for primes and subs to become compliant when um, considering CUI, which is um, kind of controlled unclassified information and being able to be compliant for those primes and subs 
there wasn't a huge adoption and it was primarily because there was no stick involved. It was just a carrot. You know, if you adopt these, these, uh, this compliance effort mandate, you are able to bid and receive contracts uh, that are related to the uh, Department of Defense. Um, it's only been recently that there has been a new uh, effort put, pushed forward, which is uh, CMMC, and it's a certification compliance, and it's audited by third parties. And that's really where the stick comes into play. And if you don't pass your audit, you do not... Uh, um, you will not be able to uh, receive any of the uh, contracts. So there, there's an enforcement mechanism. So back to your question of, you know, it, applying those kind of uh, requirements. If there is no, if there is no penalty, the adoption might be a little bit slow, but eventually um, regulatory requirements will catch up and, and institute uh, requirements for compliance. Well, great. Thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you also for being here today and fielding those questions. Now, as we wrap up, I invite you to take a few minutes to visit our business partners at the Strategic Link Virtual Trade Show and see their innovative solutions. You can see those on our website. Also, we'd love uh, to have you participate in our upcoming ERM sessions. The, first, the next one is on August 26, and that is called Protecting the Credit Union's Brand. We'll have some experts on hand for that. And then also on September 23rd, strategies for contracting in uncertain times. The COVID pandemic has presented a lot of contracting issues, making sure that you can uh, meet the requirements in the contract and making sure that others are meeting their commitments to you. So that'll be another uh, good session. And don't forget to uh, visit our website and check out the many other CU Learning Track sessions coming up in the next several months. Also, a quick word to those seeking CPE credit for this session. We will be sending you a link to a survey that you must complete to receive the credits. So be on the lookout for that and make sure you complete it. We'll use that email in that survey that you provide to uh, send your certificate back out to you uh, if you've met the requirements. Thank you again for your participation today. We'd love to hear any feedback on this topic or any other topics you would be interested in hearing about. So send us an email or give us a call. Now, stay tuned for a message from Troy Stang, NWCUA's CEO. And, whoops, we have uh, just a few seconds left on this, so uh, make sure you stay tuned. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you on the next session uh, on August 23rd. And thanks again, Mark. Thank you, Will. Thank you for being a part of CU Learning Tracks and for your engagement in the credit union movement. Your input is very important to us. When you asked for high level training and thought leadership dialogue for members of your board of directors, we heard you. We have an entire track for directors only. Highly regarded board strategists will dive deep into topics including leadership recruitment, the art of attracting and retaining diverse talent that reflects your community and appropriately contributes to the growing complexities of your credit union. We'll provide the ever popular training on credit union financials suited for the needs of today's complex credit union board of directors. And training will be provided to help your directors affirm your credit union's purpose, goals, and values, and adapt their strategic discussions and contributions in this ever-changing world. We'll explore the keys to holding virtual meetings and we'll examine high-performing directors' roles in tomorrow's merger conversations. Thank you again for being a part of the Northwest Credit Union Movement, and thank you for engaging in CU Learning Tracks. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon.